perhaps let's take this from the student perspective. So maybe you're a first year student and you come into university and you have three lab courses you have to take your first year. What do you think students think when about those lab courses? What are they anticipating, expecting? What are their, their fears for these lab courses? Maybe you even remember, I remember, when I was a student in labs and I had no idea what was going on, specifically organic chemistry and making all these crystals and I never knew if I was doing it right and at the end and then I'd find out that my purity was very low. Uh, it's a very stressful environment with labs. Teamwork, yep, lots of teamwork in labs and I also remember being assigned a lab partner who I'd never met before and I always found that a bit stressful too, learning to work with someone new uncertainty, failure. Um, some students love lab courses. They love the hands-on approach and that they're more engaging for sure. Uh, lots of work uh, and extra time too. Lab courses tend to be longer than traditional courses. So my lab course is four hours every Tuesday afternoon. Social press pressure, inspiring and fun. So they're both sides of things, good and the bad of lab courses. Lab coats, yeah, always some students stress over forgetting to bring a lab coat on a lab day or forgetting their goggles. And uh, I know I'm in the summertime when it gets hot and they forget to wear long pants. So I'm always um, monitoring them, making sure that they're still dressed appropriately for the lab session, that their hair is tied back, lots of things, a uh, high mental load with lab courses and making sure that they're prepared before they come. Great, thank you for sharing your ideas with me. Okay, so today my title of my presentation is Adopting a Holistic Approach to Teaching and Learning in Laboratory Courses. And a little bit overview of who I am. I am Dr. Patricia Hingston. I am an assistant professor of teaching. I am going up for tenure this July. So yay, lots of work right now uh, getting things ready for that. I teach three food science laboratory courses. Two of them are third year courses. Um, it's basically the same course, it just has two parts to it. And then I teach one six credit fourth year industry research project course, which is kind of like a capstone course for students where they work independently. Well, they work in groups on a research project with a company. And I don't mention it here, but I teach a large enrollment food microbiology course as well. My overview today, I'm going to talk about the motivation for the changes that I made in my lab course, what my goals were, what I used to do and what I do now, and what I found from surveying students and looking at some data and what my next steps are. So my motivation for change is that for several years, once I started teaching this course, I noticed deficiencies in students' ability to conduct statistical analysis, as well as to write scientifically. And they also had poor experimental outcomes. Our labs never quite turned out the way that they should have, um, and low practical exam grades at the end of the year. They were often in the 50 to 70 range average, um, but students definitely were not performing at what I would have expected after the amount of experience that they had throughout the entire year. And furthermore, because they weren't performing well in the third year labs, this was impacting their success for the fourth year industry research project course. And because we're working with industry, we really want our students to demonstrate their full capabilities and uh, make our program look strong to the industry that's going to be hiring our graduates. So this definitely wasn't ideal. So my goals were to strengthen students' data analysis and scientific writing abilities, enhance their comprehension of laboratory protocols, because I suspected this was playing a role in why their experiments were not turning out as planned, enhance their proficiency in laboratory techniques, also linked to understanding the laboratory protocols, but also in order to improve our technique, we need to know where we're going wrong. So a sub goal there was to help students identify where they were going wrong in the labs. Alleviate practical exam anxiety because I suspected that the reason they're performing so bad on the practical exam is because of how stressed they were. And I could see the stress. Some students broke out in hives. Others would cry uncontrollably and I'd have to try to consult them. I could visibly see how much stress a practical exam caused the students. 
and lastly, i wanted to cultivate a culture of lifelong learning so that the students want to learn and improve in their laboratory skills from third year into fourth year and into beyond in their careers and future graduate studies. My larger goals were to encourage other lab instructors to move away from results based assessments. So hopefully you here today are, are maybe looking to make that change and really focus on improving student learning in lab courses, as opposed to assessing how well they do the labs. Uh, I want to enhance laboratory education that it will always be an ongoing goal of mine and I want to help students love laboratory courses and not feel so stressed out when they're in them. So on to what I used to do and what I do now. Data analysis guidance. So I used to have a three hour workshop at the beginning of the semester that covered both data analysis. So taking raw data from a spectrophotometer and converting that to an actual concentration by going through your dilution steps. Um, and then after that, statistically analyzing the data. But student feedback said that there was a lot jammed into this three hours and that they were having a hard time fully grasping all of the aspects of the data analysis and statistical analysis. So what I did was I removed one lab from the fall semester and I put in two workshops, one on data analysis specifically and the second on how to statistically analyze that data. Now the students do take a statistical course in second year, so originally I had assumed that they would already know how to do statistical analysis, and that's why I thought one workshop would have been sufficient. Um, but now I have two, and this seems to be working much better. Uh, I also have calculation templates for each lab using Excel, and what they do is they help guide the students in their calculations, and it also helps them build strong Excel skills, um, which come in handy very frequently in the field of food science. And I also created a bunch of video tutorials on how to conduct the statistics so that students could refer back to them anytime. Um, I also record the workshops and post them to Canvas so students can also rewatch the workshops throughout the course as well. So here's an example of my calculation template. This is for a standard curve in chemistry. So here they put in the concentrations of their standards, the absorbance. They do an outlier check to see if they should remove any of the data points. I tell them where to place their curve. And then down here, they work through their food sample, which is milk, and then the di how they diluted the milk, what the dilution factor is, and then even helping them convert their units to the proper end units. So each lab has an associated document and the TAs also get a similar document where I've put in formulas into the cells so they can quickly input the students data and see if they got the correct answer. Now onto scientific writing guidance and workload, which I also found to be key. So what I used to do is nothing. I expected students to know how to write scientifically. They do take a writing course um, specific to the sciences in year one. And I just thought that they had written reports in chemistry prior. So each lab, when I took over the course, had a scientific report. So an abstract intro methods, results, discussion, and conclusion. And that's 18 reports total. And they were all done in groups of three students usually per group. What I do now is I added in a workshop on scientific writing. Again, I had to remove another lab from term one to do this. And that always makes me a bit nervous because I want students to have more laboratory experience rather than less. Um, but uh, it turns out that this is critical and just as important. So I have no regrets now. And what else I do is after I teach students how to write scientifically, they write their first report based on their laboratory data. And then I have them submit that report to me and I give them very thorough feedback on it. And then they have the opportunity to address that feedback and that's when they submit it for actual evaluation. And this is a tip I found from several books um, that I've read on student learning is, how can we expect students to do well on something the first time they're attempting it? If this is their first real scientific report, they're going to be expected to do bad on it and they're going to get a low grade. That's basically a given. 
But if you give them the feedback first, allow them to learn from it, and then submit for evaluation, you see what they're really capable of, and you're not penalizing them based on the fact that they're learning a new skill. So this applies to all aspects of, that you're teaching is try to give them practice first and feedback before you actually evaluate them on a new skill that they're learning. Uh, this does require a bit of work because this is not a group report. I now have them individual. Uh, what I students told me about the group reports is they would get stuck writing the same section each time because it would be more familiar. So they would volunteer to do the introduction for every group report, but they never learned how to write the results in discussion. So by making the first report individual, they're forced to learn how to write all of the sections themselves and they get feedback on all of the sections from me um, and a senior TA as well. So this year there was 20 students in the course and it took us about a week to get the feedback back to them. Um, with a higher number of students, you'd need more evaluators to provide the feedback, or you might have to consider groups. Um, also, instead of having 18 scientific reports, I reduced it to three scientific reports. My student evaluations of instruction consistently complained about the heavy workload in the course. And fair enough, I recognize 18 reports. If you want them done at a high quality, is a lot of work and even the three scientific reports now i see how much time it's taking the students to do them but the quality is like a real manuscript that they would submit for publication these are lengthy 20 to 30 page reports that have lots of literature that's cited so they're doing an excellent job and right now i believe three is the good amount the first two are individual so that they have to learn themselves and the last report in the second term i have as a group and that's to help prepare them for fourth year where they write their capstone project up as a group so they can learn how to write such reports in a group atmosphere as well. I also added in three memo reports. So these are about two to three pages in length and it's a more condensed form of scientific writing and feedback from graduates have told me that the memo reports have actually been the most useful for their future careers in the industry because they find they're sending that type of communication more often than they would a scientific report. Um, but the skills that they learn in writing the scientific reports helps them write the memo reports. So here's an example of a workshop activity that I have. So I have the students open a paper on Canvas and read the introduction. And in the introduction, they identify the key aspects um, that are included. So here they look for the rationale of the study, the background information of what the authors found, identify the gap in the literature, and then end off with the objective statement. So helping them see what, how is an introduction structured? And then I do the same for the methodology, the results and discussion and the conclusion, helping them look for key points. So I ask them things like, how is significance shown? Um, how, is, uh, how do you know that something's a results versus a discussion statement, especially where results and discussions are combined? And a conclusion I ask, where are the future directions or recommendations, breaking it down so that they know when they go to write what types of things they should include. Now, supporting student comprehension of laboratory protocols. What I used to do was have lab pre-lab quizzes. Um, they're worth 10% of the student's grade. They got two attempts and they had 10 minutes each to answer 10 questions regarding the lab. I also had lab videos created that were available on YouTube a while back in 2018. And at the beginning of each lab, I lecture for about 15 to 20 minutes and go over the key concepts so that they understand the principles of the lab. However, this clearly was not effective because I was still seeing poor laboratory outcomes. So what I do now is I still have the pre-lab quizzes, but they're not worth any part of the student's grade, but they have to achieve 100% in order to uh, attend the lab session. So the reason I did this is I thought about what is the purpose of the quiz and the purpose of the quiz is I want them to come prepared to the lab. The purpose is not because I want to evaluate them. I just want them to come prepared. So now it's not worth any marks, but they have to achieve 100% and they have unlimited time and they have unlimited attempts. So it's also not very stressful for them. 
before I was finding that students weren't completing the quizzes because 10% wasn't such a detrimental mark for them. So they would either not complete them or they'd be fine with getting 50% on a quiz. But now they all have to get all the questions correct to attend the lab. And I just check on Canvas before each lab session. Occasionally I had to send out a reminder saying, hey, you haven't completed the, the quiz yet. Um, but this was actually very infrequently. So the students were really good at getting 100% on the quizzes before attending the labs. The lab videos are still in use. But what I was finding is they watch the videos before they come to the lab, but when they get to the lab, they forget what they've seen in the video. So videos weren't actually as useful as I had hoped they would be. So instead, last summer, as part of a universal design for learning project that I had going, I had students create flow charts for each laboratory experiment. And this was over 80 flow charts. And we put them into the lab manual so students can visually see the labs while they're in the lab and see how to conduct the experiments. I also added in full explanations for why every step is performed in the lab protocol. Um, to really help students understand how these uh, protocols are working. It's one thing to be able to do it. It's another thing to understand what's actually happening at each of the steps. Why are we filtering? Why are we adding SDS? Why are we adding this basic compound? What are the roles of those in the experiment? So some comments from students regarding the quizzes. Uh, they say the quizzes that were not for grades helped me grow in confidence and realize it's okay to make mistakes and keep trying. Another student said, I really liked how the quizzes were not for marks, but were required for students to complete as it really helped me understand whether I understood the course material without feeling pressured to complete them under a time restriction. So the students, and I continue to see this, really like the quizzes that don't count for grades even though it's a bit extra work for them. Uh, here's my YouTube channel with 72 videos, and here's an example of one of the flow charts um, for a protein extraction experiment. Uh, here's just how I've clarified specific steps. So here I have the numbered step in a protocol, and then below in italics, I explain what is happening. So this prevents an emulsion of, uh, of the two solvents, the sodium carbonate is used to create basic conditions that are needed for the reaction to occur. So consider helping students explain why things are happening in the lab. Fostering student awareness of their errors and their progress. So what I used to do is nothing. <laughs> what I do now is they do have a lab notebook grade. And part of that grade is that they have to record lessons learned from each lab. So something that went wrong and they have to reflect on why it went wrong and what they should do next time instead. When they submit their calculations to me, I also have questions that prompt them to look at their data and assess the accuracy and precision. And if the accuracy and precision are not great, they have to explain what they think happened and how they can fix it next time. And then at the end of the term, I have reflection assignments where the students reflect on the large where they saw the largest growth in themselves and where they want to continue to grow in the, um, the following semester or the following lab course. So here's an example of my calculation submission questions where I asked them how similar their values um, were and explain possible reasons why they may be different and how close their experimental value was to the expected value and if they're differed substantially, explain possible reasons why. Please note, I do not grade the outcomes of their laboratories. Um, I only grade the correct, how correct they do the calculations and that they answer these questions, but I never grade how well the labs actually turned out. Uh, this is an example of my end of the term. What did you learn assignment? So where did you see the most growth in yourself? What are you most proud of from the term? What are some examples of the lessons learned you recorded in your lab notebook? And what would you like to continue to improve on in the next semester? And this is a discussion board where students can see each other's posts and they generally like reading, being able to read um, what others have written. Now next, fostering awareness of scientific writing errors in progress. I've talked about making lab errors or identifying their lab errors. Now we're identifying their scientific writing errors. 
before TAs did provide feedback on the written reports. Um, but now I also have students reflect on what they think they've done well in their reports and where they would like the most feedback. So this is done through a cover memo that's attached to the front of their reports. And then again, their end of the term reflection also asks them to say what they're most proud of and where they'd like to improve. So here's my cover memo that they is the first page of all their report submissions. What do you feel you did really well? What are the areas where you feel you could improve and would appreciate the most feedback? And then I also have some questions about how they used AI and which platform was used and author contributions. Now to the practical exam. Uh, what I used to do is hide all details of the practical exam. I told students they'd be doing a standard curve and they'd also be doing microbial plating, but I didn't tell them anything else like that. So for instance, I used to deduct two marks if they left their Bunsen burner unattended, but I never told them that I would deduct two marks if they did that. What I decided to do now is I provide full details of the practical exam. I actually post the full exam online for the students to see because I realized the practical exam is evaluating their skills in the lab. It's not evaluating their preparedness for that exam. So there should be no harm in showing them exactly what I'm going to be asking them to do once they get into the lab exam, because they still need to know which pipettes to use and they have to use those pipettes correctly to get a good result on the lab exam. So full details, and I also tell them things that I'm going to deduct marks for. I have a proficiency rubric, so it's out of five on full proficiency and then goes down from there. And I tell them what full proficiency looks like, like never leaving your Bunsen burner unattended, uh, sanitizing your space with ethanol before and after you're done. However, uh, during the actual practical exam, I remove that list. So they are expected to know when they're in the practical exam, those things, but I give them a heads up ahead of time of what I'm hoping or looking for while they're conducting the practical exam. And I also provided videos on how to work through the calculations that they need to do on the spot during the exam. I use different numbers in the videos, so they don't know the concentration, for instance, that they're going to get of a standard or of an unknown solution. They don't know those details, um, but I do show them how to do the calculations using other values. So my goal here was to alleviate the anxiety and improve their performance. So what did I find? Um, overall, I asked students, how did your learning experience in this lab course compared to your experiences in previous lab courses? And the majority of students said that their experience was significantly better. However, a few others said it was somewhat better or about the same. With respect to my goal of strengthening student data analysis and scientific writing abilities, I looked at the grades of the scientific reports. Uh, the first report was 82%. So this is after they um, took into consideration the feedback I provided them. Second report was 85% average and the third was 86%. So seeing slight increases and generally I'm pretty pleased with an average of 82 is what I would consider decent for this level of learning in third year lab course. Uh, both instructors and TAs, once we, I, we started implementing the feedback step, we noticed a dramatic increase in the scientific writing abilities. Um, we just realized that we weren't telling them what they were doing wrong. They weren't getting enough chance practicing the scientific writing. So once we've done this, we really noticed the quality of the reports is very, very good. And students frequently mention in their end of the term reflection how proud they are of their growth in data analysis and scientific writing. So you can actually see that they like doing these tasks. They're not daunting tasks anymore. My next steps is I would like them to rate their scientific writing abilities and confidence at the start of the year and be able to compare that to the end of the year. So there's some examples of the end of the term uh, reflections of at the end of the term, what did you learn? A student says, I'm most proud of my improvement in my lab writing, and I've been able to apply these skills in my writing for other courses as well. So I was very glad to see that they're seeing how valuable these skills are, not for just for this course, but other courses. Another student said, I the most growth in my academic writing skills, I think I gained more confidence in my scientific writing. 
and these are just a couple examples, but most students comment similarly that they're very proud of their ability to write a full scientific report. With my goal of enhancing student comprehension of laboratory protocols, I asked them um, if the experiment flowcharts help them better understand how to conduct experiments, and 100% of students strongly agreed or somewhat agreed that the flowcharts were helpful. So this was very informative for me that these are doing a good job. Goal three was to enhance student proficiency in laboratory techniques. So I said, please describe the change in your confidence level in laboratory skills throughout the course. And the majority of students said that their confidence was much higher. Um, someone said somewhat higher and only one student said about the same. Now, lastly, I looked at student practical exams grades as an indicator to see if their proficiency has increased in their laboratory techniques. In 2022, the practical exam average was 76%. In 2023, it was 82%. So it did increase by 6%. And I specifically wanted to look at the standard curves that the students were making. So in 2022, the average R squared of their standard curves on the practical exam was 0.91. And in 2023, it was a 0.94. And here's an example of what a 0.94 R squared standard curve looks like. And for a third year level, I'll take it. I wish that some of these were a little bit higher up in, in the clusters, but overall, this isn't a terrible standard curve. And the, if this is the average student in the class, I think we're doing pretty good. So that was a 3% increase in their R squared values. Now with alleviating practical exam anxiety, I asked students to what extent have the preparation materials provided in advance contributed to your confidence and reduced your stress levels during the exam. And 94% of students said the practical exam transparency significantly reduced their stress. So definitely a nice finding there as well. And lastly, to cultivate a culture of lifelong learning by helping students identify areas of growth and improvement. So I asked them if the reflective opportunities within the course helped them identify their strengths and pinpoint areas of growth. And 94% of students agreed that these activities did help them um, grow or see where their growth and see where they need to continue to grow. So my overall recommendations, if you want to improve student learning in your laboratory courses, is to help students conduct this data and statistical analysis that are relevant for your course. Never assume that they know how to do it from a previous course. Start with what they need to learn in your course and teach it to them. This can be done through workshops. You can use calculation templates, videos, etc. Help them to write scientifically. Again, don't assume that they know how. Help them. Uh, learn these skills, especially as it's relevant for your field, and see if you can provide them with feedback before you evaluate them. Help them to understand the laboratory protocols. You can use videos or flow charts or quizzes where they have to get 100% or try to write your instructions very clearly, simply, and fully explain what's happening in each step. And lastly, help students to identify their errors so that they can improve. So this can be lessons learned in their notebook or questions that have them reflect on their data and what possibly went wrong. Recommendations to reduce student anxiety in laboratory courses include avoiding results based assessments, at least until the very end of a course. I know I still have a practical exam because I do want to know how well they're doing, but try to hold off until they've really had enough practice with the skills. Try providing full transparency. This will help alleviate stress and when students aren't as stressed, they do better. Try to foster a culture of lifelong learning so they're not there just trying to get grades, that they're actually seeing their own growth and this motivates them to want to continue to grow and to see that it's okay to make mistakes. And lastly, I want to thank my students who are always so willing to fill out my many surveys. So this is my cohort from this past year. We did a food plant tour at Big Mountain Foods. Okay, I have no idea how long I've talked for, 35 minutes. Could be worse, so not too bad. Uh, so my last questions to you are perhaps, what's one thing you'd like to implement um, from today's session that you've learned from me 
or do you have other tips of things that you've been doing in your lab courses that you've seen have been very effective for learning? I learned, I, I paid for the program that I'm using for my flowcharts, but I recently learned from someone that, oh, I forget the name of it, Visio, does that sound right? Um, that's actually free through our UBC Microsoft um, and has similar capabilities. So try the, the free flowchart program. I don't find PowerPoint is good enough for doing what I needed to do. I use a mix of individual and group reports along with memo reports, yeah. The flowcharts were a lot of work, so I definitely recommend, um, especially if there's still universal design for learning funding, that's $10,000. I used that to hire two students, plus I applied for work learn funding to basically double that, and the students worked on the flowcharts all summer long. So that is a quite a bit of a project if you have a, a lengthy laboratory course, especially a six credit. If you have a, a three credit or just perhaps a few lab sessions, you might be able to do it yourself. Can I comment on what reference or materials have you used to lay out the structure of group scientific reports and memos? Um, so are you basically referring to the reference, or not reference, the rubric on like what I expect of students and what my criteria are for each of those sections? I'm happy. Um, how do I come up with that? It's evolving. I'm constantly changing it. I've definitely um, referred to a lot of resources online because there are quite a few ways uh, rubrics out there for scientific writing already, but they never quite fit exactly what I'm looking for. So I've modified it myself um, and each category is out of five. I'm happy to share my rubrics if anyone wants to email me uh, after. I'm happy to share any of my materials that you may be interested in. So patricia.hangstonutbc.ca. Um, and I like using the same rubrics throughout so that students can see how they're improving um, in the different rubric categories on each of their reports. And I'm always very transparent. So all my rubrics are published at the start of the year so students know exactly how they're going to be evaluated on everything. I used to be scared to be transparent, but now that I've, I've been really changing all of my courses to be completely fully transparent with everything with students. I just you, once you do it, you can't go back. Um, I don't know why we have such a fear initially. We're afraid it's going to help them cheat, but we, we want them to do well and being transparent helps them do well. So. Yeah, a question. Yeah, so thanks for everything. I thought this would take me a long time to just write it down. So um, my question was that you mentioned about those three hour workshops, uh, kind of orientations into different things from statistics, uh, statistical analysis to um, other um, learning outcomes that you design for the students. Um, how did you, were these recorded or it was part of your um, lab a schedule, uh, because it's usually I find it difficult to find time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was wondering if you have recorded those or you just use your lab time for that. Yeah, so my lab is every Tuesday afternoon from one to five. So my first three lab sessions I use as workshops and I actually book a classroom for them. And I call them workshops, not lectures, because they're very interactive and it's me working through situations and examples with the students. So first I have them work through it alongside me at the same time, and then I have them work through it themselves, and then I go through the answer with them afterwards. Um, and I also have quizzes associated with these workshops and assignments, and they have to get 100% on the assignment quiz before they can submit the assignment. So it further makes sure that they fully understand what's going to be expected of them on the assignment before they complete it. Um, and then I record the workshops while they're going on and I post them to Canvas afterwards so that if they want to go back and see how I did a statistical analysis in Excel or in Jamovi, they can go back and see that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to find the time, and I was really anxious to remove labs to do this. Um, but, you know, it's not just lab skills in my course. They need to learn these other skills, too, so it's definitely worth the investment. Um, do you have an activity where the students create their own flowchart? No, I do not at the moment, but I like the sounds of that idea. 
um, for a lab that could actually that's a lie I used to have that as a requirement for the pre lab um, that they would have to create their own flow charts in the lab manual, um, but. I guess that would have worked as well, but I found that some students, the quality of the flow charts really varied and it just because they drew it themselves doesn't mean they got it right, so they might not be following the right flow chart, but really what's most helpful in the flow chart is not seeing the like sometimes the students they would just write out the steps. But they can't visualize the steps because they've never done the experiment before and what the flow charts do is I show them exactly what the tube is going to look like what the flask is going to look like because they have all the materials in front of them. But they don't know which ones to grab for which parts of the experiment so having a visual flow chart that shows them what the centrifuge tubes look like helps them make sure that they're choosing the right equipment for the job. Um, do you have an example to share uh, the flow chart? Um, I have one in the slides here. So here on the right side is my flow chart. So what I mean is now the students can see, okay, I'm transferring from a small Eppendorf tube to a centrifuge tube. And then down here, I'm working with a larger centrifuge tube. It just, the, the visual part is nice. When they were doing the flow charts themselves, they just wrote out the words of the steps but actually seeing the equipment and what it looks like is, is helpful. And thank you to everyone who is attending. Small group, but I figured that laboratory education was probably a niche area. So quality over quantity, glad to have everyone here. For the flow charts, I used Universal Design for Learning Fellows Program. Last year was the very first cohort. Right now, the second cohort is ongoing. Um, I believe that I don't know how long the program is going to keep going, but I suspect another year. So uh, when that funding call comes out, feel free to submit. This was making the labs more accessible to students and the majority of my students speak English as an additional language. And I think that was playing a large role in them not understanding the laboratory protocols. So I also um, took care in structuring my lab manual to really be easy to understand, like avoiding any un uh, complicated words that were unnecessary and just simplifying everything. Uh, the video, I got a private question, the, the videos the students like the videos, they watch them before they come to the lab, but then they can't remember all the details of the video when they get to the lab. So they still would forget which piece of equipment to use for which steps. Like oftentimes they'd use the wrong beaker or the wrong flask, and then we'd have to get them another one because they don't have an, enough 100 milliliter flasks. They use that instead of using the 1000 milliliter flasks, etc. So videos are great, but they're not as helpful when the students are actually in the lab. And the harder part about the videos too is um, a lot of them are out of date now because I've been modifying my protocols to uh, improve the experimental outcomes. And each time you modify, you have to create a new video or edit it. And it's just an extreme amount of work. Um, whereas with the flow charts, when I make a change to the experiment, it doesn't require me so much work to update the flow charts. So, um, a lot of maintenance if you're making videos. Any other remaining questions? Otherwise, you're welcome to hop off and enjoy the rest of your day.